Haisong Tang is an advisor to Caring, the large global luxury company, and he and his wife Florence, who is also here with us, you'll meet Florence hopefully, uh, they live between Shanghai and Paris. This is uh, one, of the, one of the most essential Chinese-French joint ventures uh, in the world. So with this, I'd like to welcome to the stage Haisong Tan. Are you ready for some Chinese jokes? <laughs> Politics is too heavy, right? What is the most useful Chinese invention in your mind? I think it's the chopsticks. My name is Hai Song. I was born as a rice farmer uh, in a small village about 20 minutes away from Shanghai Pudong Airport. Now I'm also a farmer. A mine, I, I call myself a mine farmer. I invest in ideas, in technology. So I do investments in India, in Israel, heavily involved in semiconductor industry <coughs> and some future technology. Um, I spent some time in Israel because for me, the Israeli military is something is very fundamental in helping the entrepreneurism in Israel today. Also, in the spare time, I teach in a local university in China. The course is at the military technology and finance. Think about it. Today, without DARPA, the DOD organization, we will not have internet. We will not have a GPS. Without GPS, without internet, we will not have here today. Probably 50% economy will be collapsed. So we have to thank the military for what have done in the past, even though we all have very ambivalent feeling towards war. So the idea is we want to, in my class, we talk about cyber war, the future space exploration, DAPA, we talk about Israel. We also talk about essentially the future technology's importance in our society. We're carrying something more fun. So I advise the carrying group on how can you make the leather for your bag in the lab instead of taking from the cow? How can you put the semiconductor chip in your shoes, in your bags, so we can monitor your consumer experience? So there's a lot of happening in luxury, and I think Gucci probably is the brand to watch. But they are going to be the number one in terms of uh, revenue, surpassing LV. In the past, I had to learn that the future is about technology. Even though, unfortunately, I think technology is not the solution for the hum humanity. In fact, the past 20 years is the worst time in the hu humanity that the polarization between the poor and rich is the worst. Currently, we have a 0.1% of the population probably own more than 60 or 70% of wealth. And that's a major problem. But we have to look at technology as government, <coughs> as a human individual, because that's the future. What I observe about technology is changing dramatically. Number one, technology, I think a pure, how we're the, like the software alone boom is, is basically near the end. The hardware is getting renaissance. So you see the hardware company became more and more important. The second, usually we have a computer and mobile phone as the center of your life, but now the computing is moving towards ambience, which means even your toilet can, can, can be computing, your automobile, your microwave, everything. So computing is moving from your mobile phone to the edge. The third is the importance of voice. So this year, if you go to CES, Amazon and Google, they're fighting for the voice. But fundamentally, all of this is semiconductor. So if you look into the future technology, if you do not look at semiconductor, you basically you're missing the big picture. Software and hardware, the difference, for me, software is a capitalistic liberal, liberalism thinking. That is why the Elon Musk has such a big time, big difficulty in manufacturing his cars. Because Elon Musk's idea is a software mindset. It's about you ship the product, you reiterate. But hardware, it's about communistic, authoritarian way of doing things, process management. That is why I predict the future technology is moving to the east. Not only China, actually more important is Taiwan. Taiwan essentially controls the electronics supply chain. They have TSMC. If today mainland China attack Taiwan, <coughs> TSMC disappearing, the world economy will collapse because the TSMC produces 50% of the chips today globally. 
South Korea is also extremely important. Without South Korea, you would not have mobile phones. But they dominate in the DRAM and the 3D NAND, the memory chips. So we have to look into East, talk about technology. China was inventive or not? Actually, Chinese has been disrupted for 800 years. In the past, Chinese was very inventive. When Europe was in the dark age, China basically contributed about 39 of the 70 most useful inventions before 1500, including chopsticks. After that, China basically collapsed. Europe started to rise with Martin Luther, the approach in the Bible. Now, there's a few notable things about China at that time. Have been to Hangzhou before? Hangzhou now today is the headquarter of Alibaba and the other companies. At that time, it was really the Silicon Valley of the 13th century. What's amazing about Hangzhou is it was the first town to produce sex toys for women only in the 1200s. Think about it. So at that time, you might not know him. He was the Da Vinci of China. He developed compass. At the same time, like Robert invited a poet yesterday, at that time, all the scientists, they're poets, they write choreography, and then they play music. The other thing maybe from Hangzhou is very interesting about tea. My friends always ask, why the Chinese have so many people? I think maybe it's the tea. Tea is aphrodisiac. So the Chinese probably have more time spending time making kids instead. Now, <clears throat> the typical point, tipping point of China is 1421. Columbus went to discover America in 1491. Seven years before, Zheng He was a castrated Muslim general from China. He was the first global man. But since that time, the world is really connected. He was the first one to have the nation fleet, navy fleet, to go to Africa. So this is really well recorded in 1421. Think about the renaissance of the Chinese culture and Chinese technology. It happens in 1976. For 800 years, basically, we were dead. China really was helped by internet. Internet is perfect for China, perfect for India, perfect for Israel. The reason why? Because we have population. We have a population density. We have a really poor infrastructure, such as a financing transaction. And we have very little moral or legal framework. In the United States, I think it's over-regulated. Anything you do, you go to Congress. In China, let's do it first. Then let's, let's figure out how to regulate. And the other thing is about Chinese, we have Las Vegas syndrome. We all know we contribute most to the gambling business in the world. The Chinese people of war were natural born gamblers. So China is complicated. <coughs> well, I'm not here to talk about politics. China is communistic, China is capitalistic, China is confusion. So I call China a 4C, capitalistic, communistic, confusion China. And we have a long-term leadership, right? We don't call him emperor. We have long-term leadership, good or bad. But now the question is, is democracy is really the only form of government? Does this really work in China or India? In China also, you have to be careful, government is different from party. So in China, party rules. So if you go to Davos, China, for example, whatever prime minister says doesn't really count. He represents the government. So sometimes you see, if you're Chinese, you start to notice, we never, never pay attention to the prime minister. But whatever he says is contradictory to what par party says, usually she says. So China is actually not one China. <clears throat> it's not Taiwan and China either. It's uh, 300 million Americans, 900 Africans, and the rest probably Southeast Asia. So it's very complex. And I think uh, this is why also China is very attractive for a lot of business. There's some notable <coughs> development in China. Number one is the real system. Like yesterday, I was in the uh, session talking about mobility. Chinese government spent 10 years to build this high-speed rail system. The, the biggest human trafficking in the human history is the Chinese rail system. With the Spring Festival, seven days, we transport a billion people. Can you imagine that? So if you go to China, you have to take the high-speed train from Shanghai to Beijing, it only takes five hours. It's like TGV in France. The other one is we have two ecosystems, payment system. 
So for example, today in China, never carry cash. Everything transacted either through Alipay or WeChat. If you're a beggar today in China, if you don't have Alipay mobile phone, you cannot beg either. <laughs> they will not give you any cash anymore. Of course, Huawei, everybody knows. Starting from nowhere, nothing. It's a company basically came by Qualcomm, Cisco, and Apple. You have to give credit to the entrepreneur and the Chinese government for whatever they have achieved. Of course, <coughs> these are the companies you already might know, but there's the Uncur Champions. You might not have heard of this company, semiconductor equipment company. Typically, it's dominated by the Americans, the Europeans, <coughs> LAM, Apply Material, ASML. This company actually is world class. They're making etching machines. They make it MOCVD, which is very important for the basically semiconductor fab. This is the biggest battery company in the world today. It was supported by Fujian government. Right now they are listed, it's about probably 70 billion to 100 billion dollar company. Now everybody complained Chinese, we all copy. Yes, we did. Xiaomi copy Apple. But this is the one probably the most sexy e-scooter designed by the local Chinese team called Neo. In Europe, right now, they have 50% of market share. They sell about a million e-scooters in China today. Have you heard of this company? This is a Chinese company based in Shenzhen, but they only sell in Africa. One of thirds of the mobile phones sold in Africa is this company. But their business model is not only selling phones. What they want to do is building a payment system. Imagine now you have the payment system, what's going to happen in Africa? They can put on e-commerce, delivery, everything. This company is going to become one of the biggest Chinese company ever, called M-Finance, it's part of Alibaba. They are basically, without <coughs> people noticing, they're already building up all the payment system in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in India, as well as in North Africa, in Middle East. The idea is they want to build the payment system first for the countries where 80% of people don't have bank accounts. There's no bank branch. Once they have that payment system, imagine what you can do above that. So Africa is one billion people. It will be the biggest market in the future by 2030 or 2040. I, I, and finance is already well positioned to take advantage. So the question right now is, can Communist China innovate? I think yesterday, Navin Jin talked about basically the importance of entrepreneur. I believe is a tech community in China and United States are too arrogant. I don't think nation state will disappear. I don't think company state is gonna help. In fact, I think tech community right now is really destroying the society. What we need is still need, I call the government university industry complex. <clears throat> that happened, Chinese model currently today is replicating all the models happening in the United States in the 1950s. Think about it. Between 1945 to 1971, that's called a golden quarter, like 25 years. All the technology we're using today all came from that period. What happened after World War II? It was government heavily funded. Without government funding, we will not have quantum physics. Without government funding, we will not have NASA. Without government funding, we will not have internet. Today, Google, Alibaba, all these companies benefit from the heavy investment from the government. This is actually why I think the Chinese might have an edge over the Europe and United States in terms of long-term investment. So, what's happening in China? I think one thing notable is about result-driven investment. Typically, in the United States right now, if I VC, no one's interested in investing in semiconductor because it takes long to really like, take a return on the equity. Only the Chinese are doing that right now. So instead of focusing on return on equity, if you focus on results, that's very different. That's why merit is important. In merit, you don't care about return on equity, you care about results. The second is we have, we have to thank the United States for training so many Chinese talents. I'm the beneficiary of the US education system, but there's millions of Chinese like me today trained in the United States, we're giving back, we're contributing back to the resurgence of the Chinese economy. The other thing, China is the only country with the complete industrial ecosystem. United Nations has categorized 762 industries. China is the only country that have that system. That's a huge advantage over any other countries. Because the United States are already moving out, 
like all the manufacturing to Asia. Europe made the same mistake. Um, the other thing is, I think the lack of legal and the moral standard at a certain stage probably is, is good for innovation. If you're heavily regulated, for example, <coughs> privacy issue, if I ask my kids, 15 years old, they don't care about privacy. The policies made by politicians at the age of 50, like my age or 60, is not going to help the future of Europe. And China benefit from that because the lack of privacy, lack of uh, moral private framework. So, <coughs> China usually being basically accused of stealing technology from the United States. So during the Obama administration, Chinese hackers were hacking to all the U.S. companies, while the U.S. hackers hacking to Chinese companies. Yes, we did. And the, typically, Chinese ways, besides grassroots innovation, we do joint ventures. For example, nuclear power, <coughs> the real system. We work with the Europeans, we work with Americans. We learn from them. The second is, before we do a lot of acquisition, merger acquisition, but now it's very difficult. With the CFIS, with the German government, essentially it's impossible for Chinese to do any overseas equip, uh, acquisition these days in technology area. The third is, Chinese start to legally invest in Silicon Valley companies and Tel Aviv companies. Also, this has caused a lot of trouble today in the United States. I think it will be stopped. So Chinese investors will be targeted by the FBI. So they basically, look, you cannot invest in AI companies in Silicon Valley. The other thing Chinese do is study abroad. <coughs> we have a lot of Chinese studying in the United States, probably over 300,000 Chinese students. This is a really big source of innovation for China today. So where possibly China can dominate in the future? I think four notable areas. Number one, semiconductor. For me, AI, everybody talk about AI. AI is completely a bubble. Today's AI maximum is uh, Norman Werner's cybernetics. He was a professor from MIT. <laughs> he wrote a book called Cybernetics in 1960, uh, 1948. If you think of DeepMind, everything they do is about computational analysis. So what I mean is, in the future, five years from now, all the AI company, if you don't have the chip, that are consuming really, con computing really fast, but at the same time have very little energy, you're not going to succeed. The second is, Quantum computing. Quantum computing is going to be the Manhattan project of the future. Because AI is about fast computation. If you have a quantum computing, essentially, you have everything. The third is synthetic biology. Because we have a lack of a moral, a lack of a legal framework. So Chinese are actually already doing a lot of genetics, the microbiome. Guess which country has most of the shit? It's China. <laughs> Not only that, we're also looking to <coughs> We're also looking to RNA, other epigenetic, like uh, basically the measures. So China actually is going to, in gene editing, or the biology side, I think China probably leads in the future, not only for the biology, pharmaceutical, but also for food industry. The other thing is about space. United States and Europe is going to decommission RSS by 2024. China will be the only country with a workable space station by 2024. So these are all serious government initiative. So this is like in the Chinese are investing $47 billion in a semiconductor fund. Chinese is also investing $10 billion in the quantum computing. China is the only country launched quantum satellites last year. Of course, people worry about made in China 2025. And the other scary big project is from Xi is a one bear one road. So China is exporting over capacity, is exporting the cheap currency to countries like Africa, South America, as Southeast Asia. So one thing as a Chinese, always troubled. In China, the problem for me is if I use internet, I have to use VPN, which means lack of freedom. So it's really contradictory in a country that you cannot even have access to the internet, there's no freedom of speech, are you going to have innovation? Are you going to invent new things? I think the question of when can China, communist China invent or innovate is the question of the next century, this century. It's a big historic question. Now I want to take a bet here. Anyone believe China can in invent, innovate, that communist China can innovate? Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, the rest I assume you don't believe. 
So I hope we will live long enough to see the result who win the bet. Thank you very much. Hi, Song, I have one question for you, and Only I hope one? people were pay but I have many more. I, I hope people are paying attention. Some of the things you said were quite scary, profound, provocative on purpose. So please engage with Hai Song and Florence. But I have one question for you. I, I have two young children. Your children are lovely, a little bit older. What is one thing that you and Florence encourage them to learn about to prepare for this future? Speak French. <laughs> Français? Oui? Actually, it's interesting. C'est impossible. Non. Yeah, c'est possible. Because <laughs> by 2030, I believe the future is in the East. I believe China is already peaked. The next countries will, will come up is India. It's about 1.5 billion. Then Southeast Asia, you have 800 million. Then Africa. And in Africa, think about 1 billion people by 2030 or 2035 will speak French. So forget about Chinese. Study French is the future. Mon Dieu. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. <laughs> so consider, consider what you've just seen. It's sobering, but should also be energizing. We need China to succeed. We all need China to succeed. But also, think about this notion that Hai Song shared, which is lack of moral framework. Uh, I don't know if I would go as far as to say lack of moral framework, but I think you understand his point. I've written a bit about three emerging data philosophies in the world. One, in the US, has tended for some time to favor corporations. The one in Europe, GDPR and all of this stuff, has tended to favor individuals, but really these are a dance, each is a dance between individuals and corporations for the most part. China's very clear, favors government, full stop. They have restrictions for individuals and corporations, but government can do whatever it wants, whatever, whenever it wants, with whatever data it pleases. Now, we might have our beliefs and desires for a liberal democratic society, I know I do, and I'm not asking you in this thought experiment to consider which world you would prefer to live in. This is an essential question, but a different question. But I want to pose a quick thought experiment to you. And it is a thought experiment, not an assertion or a recommendation. The thought experiment is, imagine two societies. One society has complete, utter, protection of all individual data at all times from everyone with the sole discretion of the individual whose data is being used or shared. Complete protection and privacy. The other society has complete and utter access for everyone and everything to every bit of personal, personal data at all times for anything. Which society performs better economically? I'm not talking about all the other factors we love in our lives, but economically. For me, this creates a conundrum, a conundrum that we will have to navigate over the rest of this century. And I let you think through that thought experiment. Thank you again, Hai Sung. That was a, a fantastic and exciting presentation.